There I was on the beach, on the shores of Lake Michigan in Evanston, Illinois, where I live, about a mile from my house, chanting those words from the morning liturgy. Elohai nishama shanatata bi tohorahi. In essence, thank you, God, for giving me my soul back, giving it to me this morning, as you do every morning, my pure soul. I wasn't davening shachri. In fact, I was there in a bathing suit with three of my dear friends. And surrounded by lots of beachgoers, I was marking a new start that day. But how did I get there? In the months preceding that day, I had been moving toward a divorce, a secular divorce, moving toward a court date. The court date, which my lawyers had so graciously made sure would happen before my 50th birthday, because that seemed really important. If this divorce that I hadn't anticipated or wanted was going to happen, well, then at least let me do it before I turned 50 and I could turn a new corner. The other corner I needed to turn, I realized, was a Jewish corner. I had begun my marriage under a chuppah. I had begun it in a Jewish way. I needed to end my marriage in a Jewish way, too. So I made plans, thought, I wondered what to do. I knew I needed to do something Jewish, but what? I'm a rabbi. I should know what to do. But I didn't. So I started researching, because I do that too. I went on the internet. I looked at Ritual Well, which is an amazing website for innovative ritual. I opened my books. I looked at an article I published years ago when my friend Laura and I created a ritual to mark her divorce. It didn't work. I just didn't know. One day, I even found myself riding my bike along the Sheridan Road and right by Northwestern University near where I live. I had just dropped my children off at sailing camp at Northwestern. I was holding my handlebars and holding my cell phone with the speaker on because it was the only time I could get to talk to my friend Aaron. We had this window. I know, safety hazard. My kids will figure that out when they watch this video, right? So we were talking. I said, what should I do? And time and again, my friends, my experts said, get a get. A get? A traditional Jewish writ of divorce? That's awesome for some, and it's halachic, and it's meaningful. But what I knew of a get was that it was handed, go through the whole process, and it was handed by a man to his wife, dropped into her hands. And she was the passive recipient. That wasn't going to fly for me. I'm all about egalitarian ritual. I'm the mother of boy-girl twins. They were welcomed into the covenant together. My son was circumcised. My daughter was wrapped in my talit. Get didn't seem to do it. But again and again, my friends, my experts said, get a get, have it in your pocket. And that stayed with me. So I made arrangements to go and get a halachic get in Chicago. A dear friend who's an Orthodox rabbi helped me make that connection. Not that I needed it, but it felt good to have someone making the phone call for me and bridging that. But I just knew that wasn't going to do it either. So I kept calling and asking and reaching out to my friends. And finally, one of my dear friends, my friend Andrea, who's a wise professor of the Hebrew Bible and a generally wise woman, said to me, Lisa, you'll know. I'll know. I haven't known anything in the last year. I've gone from sad to angry to frustrated to disappointed and have just gone day to day. I'll know what to do in this ritual. She said, you'll know. I spoke to another dear friend, a rabbinic colleague in London who had been divorced a few years ahead of me, and she said, well, when you figure this out, include Shehachianu. Well, that seems kind of weird. Shehachianu is a blessing for firsts, for joyous occasions. But I held on to both those thoughts, and I stepped back. I looked within. What did I know? I know that I love water. I love outdoor water under the sky. Give me a lake, a river, an ocean. I'm in it. So a mikvah seemed interesting. Mikvah is our ritual bath that allows us to have Jewish transformations. But a ritual seemed awfully, a mikvah seemed awfully small and confined for me. Natural water seemed, well, that was important. What else did I know? I knew I wanted community with me. I wanted friends who understood me, who had traveled this journey with me, but not people I had to teach and explain. I wasn't in rabbi mode. I was in me mode. 
So I needed people who would pick up the pieces if I didn't know what to do. Andrea had faith in me. I'm not sure I had faith in me. So I needed people who would help me figure out what to do. And so I made plans. I arranged with three very dear friends who had traveled the previous year with me, who had been at my side as friends, and who I knew were, were knowledgeable Jews, and I knew would pick up the pieces if I didn't know what to do on the beach. We agreed to meet at the beach. This was after my secular divorce, after I'd gotten my get. And we met at the beach that morning. You may have remembered I said I was wearing a bathing suit. Those of you who've gone to the mikvah know you go to the mikvah naked. I wasn't going to do that on a public <laughs> beach. <laughs> Didn't seem wise. So we met at the beach. We talked for a few minutes, and I began with Elohai Neshama, these powerful words. And then I went into the water. When one goes to the mikvah, you immerse three times. Three in Judaism is a number of intentionality. When you do something three times, you mean to do it. Many of you may have been at a gravesite and may have added three shovels full of earth to the grave. That means you intended to do it. I immersed completely. You go under the water, not touching the ground. I came out. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam asher kitshana b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu al ha The blessing for immersing in the mikvah. I went in again, I immersed completely. The water was cold, it was refreshing. Often Lake Michigan is really cold this time of year. <laughs> I came out. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And I went in again, completely under the water, and I came out. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam she'achiyanu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu l'azman hazeh. I came back onto the beach. My friends greeted me with a great hug, with prayer, with song, with words of wisdom. Andrea was right. I knew it was right. In the weeks to come, I wrote about the experience. I had opened a document on my computer sometime back to dump in the emotions of the year. I wasn't really journaling. It wasn't really an essay. It was just stuff. I started writing about that experience, and ultimately it took shape as an essay. I wrote and I wrote, and finally a friend of mine who's a journalist said, Lisa, you might have something here. You could actually publish an essay. Uh oh, this is mine. What do I want to do with that? But as I shaped those thoughts and other friends looked at it, I realized that there was something there. So I wrote an essay that I then published on Huffington Post called What Do You Wear to Get Divorced? The conversation started just like that. The day I was going to court for my secular divorce, I stood in front of the mirror in my house, and I had a conversation. My father and my grandmother told me what to wear. My father said, wear a black suit. He always said, wear a black suit. He, too, is a rabbi. <laughs> it looks elegant. My grandmother said, wear pearls. You need pearls with that. That was her thing. These are her pearls. The funny thing is, they're both dead. But I heard their voices loud and clear as I thought about what to wear. That essay spoke about the question of what to wear to my divorce, but it spoke beyond that. It spoke about my search for meaningful Jewish ritual to mark my divorce. And oh my goodness, the response was amazing. A friend of mine called me the next day and said, you're trending. <laughs> I don't trend. I'm a geek. I'm a mother of three kids. I'm a rabbi. I like to read and study. I don't trend. He said, you're trending. OK. Well, in the two years since that article's come out, I realized that it's touched people's lives. It's opened the doors to conversation. People I know, people I don't know, have written me, emailed me, come across a room in a space they don't know me and said, hey, I found your piece, and thank you. You gave me words that I didn't have. You spoke words that I couldn't speak. You wrote words I needed to hear, to see. I put your essay on my desk to remind me. So what I realized was that if I, who am a rabbi and a student of ritual and a lover of ritual, had a heck of a time creating ritual for myself, that I had something to offer other people. People who might not even know that there was Jewish ritual that existed or could be created to mark their divorce. And so I share with you my insights, which I hope will help you, friends, family, who knows. Because Judaism gives us tremendous ritual and tremendous opportunity to make time sacred in our lives. But it doesn't cover every moment. And even if it says it covers a moment, it may not speak completely to our experience. 
and we have the opportunity to create and to recreate. My takeaways are the following. I realized that this was a process, that all the emotions went hand in hand, the joy, the sorrow, the affirmation of a new status, whatever, they came together. I realized that I had to look within to find out what I needed. I realized that I was not alone. I had friends who had walked the year with me leading to my divorce and friends who accompanied me on the beach that day. And I realized, well, I already knew it, but I realized again that Judaism had, it had the wealth of what I needed already. I could take the prayers, the rituals of our tradition, claim them and reclaim them and reshape them for what I needed at that time. And so I did. So what I say to you today is, we have the room in our tradition to create our ritual. You have permission to create ritual. It might be for divorce, and it might be for who knows what. So here are the questions I give you to help you guide, to guide you to do that. First, where are you? That is, what are you looking to mark? Joy, sorrow, who knows? Second, who are your peeps? Who are the people who journey with you? Who are the people who you can sit down with over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or a really good dish of ice cream and say, what am I doing here? What do you know about me? They might be Jewish. They might be rabbis or cantors or Jewish scholars. Or they might be your sister or next door neighbor who just know you really well. But they can start the conversation with you. Third, what pieces of our tradition speak to you? They might be, if you're looking to create ritual for divorce, they might be the traditional ones, a get or mikvah. But they might be things that you can reinvigorate and give new meaning to. Take off the mezuzah on your front door and put on a new one that's yours. Mark Havdalah, the separation at the end of Shabbat. Don't only mark the end of Shabbat, mark the end of one stage of your life or a new one. Or who knows? And lastly, what is it that feels right to you? What felt right to me was to create my own mikvah on the shores of Lake Michigan and to go there with my friends, to claim the prayers of my tradition and to do it in my way. But what might be right for you would be to repaint your house. Might be to sit with a bunch of friends and a bottle of wine and talk about what you're affirming, it's new. Might be who knows what. Most importantly, though, do it. Judaism tells us again and again that we have the ability to create sacred time, sacred space. We have permission to do this. So go do it. For me, it was reclaiming mikvah and reclaiming Shehechianu. My wise friend Rebecca was right. Shehechianu was the prayer for me to say because I was marking a new space, a new time in my life. What will you do? Tell me about it. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, shechianu, v'kiyamanu, v'higiyanu, l'asman hazeh.